happy Thanksgiving to you. Hey, one thing I like about the... Hello, wait, let me get this thing adjusted. We're getting terrible booms here. Hello, 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 test. Hello, test. Let's see, hello. Oh, that's even worse. Hello, test, 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 test. Hello, one, two, three. That's better. One, two, three, four. Hello. <laughs> wait a minute. There we go, there we go. There we go. Now it's really working. Hello, one, two. Hey, gang, we got the equipment going here. How do you like that? Bring it up there, big Charlie. Let's go. Everything cool in there, George? Well, it is, after all. What are you going to do? I mean, everybody's got a day off except guess who? Guess who? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, how, how, would you like you, would you like something good to start off the Thanksgiving uh, festivities? Uh, you know, on a real on a real spooky note. Uh, do you mind uh, Innsbruck, Austria? Little thing that just came in the news here: a ten foot python missing for forty seven days from a circus was yesterday at last found by a chambermaid in an Innsbruck hotel room. The girl had the unbelievable fright of her life. You imagine this? When she tugged at its tail, it was in a closet. She tugged at its tail, believing it was a tie, forgotten by some dill doc tourist who had just vacated the room. Please, George. Oh, wow. Yeah. You mind if I, uh, when they, uh, when, is it, when there's something to weigh, the cats will play, isn't it? I'm going to play a little juice out here, unless it, uh, you know, it bothers you too much. Here we go. Just getting warmed up here. Uh, it's Thanksgiving, yeah. Hey, listen, uh, speaking of Thanksgiving, uh, I'm going to ask a rhetorical question here to you. Did you ever spend a Thanksgiving in the armed services at all? Did you, George? You were in the Marines. Uh, did you, did you, uh, do you, do you, can you actually recall it? Well, I'll tell you, I had a, I had a Thanksgiving uh, one time. I, you don't mind if I... Uh, if I uh, bother you here a little bit today and uh, talk about the Army, do you? <laughs> a lot of guys get very nervous when you mention the Army. But uh, when I, uh, one Thanksgiving, I'll never forget, you know, it really, it really, it really made it uh, in, a, in a curious way. And only a guy that's been in the Army can understand exactly what this is all about. So, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if you're a sensitive type, I would suggest you go back and try your toothbrush again. Maybe it'll work this time. But uh, one time, I'm in the Army, see... And, and uh, <laughs> they came out, and here we were, you know. We were in this place. There was nothing but rain all the time. And it was, uh, at this point, we were in the Ozarks. And it was just raining and raining. And it was, either, it was either cold and raining, or it was hot and raining, or it was uh, dusty and raining. I don't know how it managed it at the same time, but it did, you know. If, you, could, you could have dust flying in your face and rain hitting on top of your head all at the same time. You, you, your bottom could be cold and your top is hot, and uh, you could you could have uh, frostbite and uh, heat rash simultaneously. Of course, that was all part of the uh, uh, the uh, I guess the mystique of this thing, and and there was nothing for miles around, absolutely nothing. Uh, there were 458 million guys in this one camp, and the nearest town, which was about 15 miles away. You could only get to by one bus that went every half hour. Well, of course, you had 130,000 guys. And I mean 130,000, exactly 130,000, which is roughly about five times the size of Trenton. That's how many guys you had in this camp. Well, uh, you, I don't have to describe to you what would happen whenever they would hand out a pass, you know, like on the Friday afternoon or 
Saturday morning when they give out the passes, there was a line of guys that would stretch roughly from Manhattan to New Brunswick, New Jersey, for guys just waiting for that bus. Now, where did the bus take them? Well, it took them to a, a town that was about the size, I would say, of Times Square. That town. And what did it have in it? Well, it had two diners. It had the Blue Eagle Diner. It had, uh, which was a colorful diner. It had a hotel which had about 12 rooms in it that were constantly being booked by these tall, large ladies that wore red dresses. It had, uh, it had one tiny USO and 6,948 beer taverns that sold nothing but watered beer at uh, about 60 cents a glass to the GIs, you know, who obviously could afford it because they were making well over, some of them making well over $45 a month, you see. So uh, it, was, it was all in all a happy situation. So this, this went on for like, uh, oh, it must have been about like eight months. And nobody in my company had ever gotten out to any place. We were always on bivouac, way out in the boondocks. And we had been on bivouac now before Thanksgiving. Bivouac, of course, uh, if you don't know what bivouac is. Bivouac is the other side of going camping. Now, a lot of you out there, uh, <laughs> a lot of you out there, <laughs> I wonder how many guys formed a lifelong hatred for camping because of bivouac. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> well, uh, it, it, uh, it's camping. And what do you do? Well, you camp in this, this little thing, a little pup tent. It's a shelter half, two shelter halves hooked together. Yeah, that's right, in the rain with the tent pegs and these little poles. And the tent is roughly about three and a half, maybe two and a half to three feet high. You don't stand up in it or anything. It's just a little shelter half. It's a little tent. It's a little, little uh, triangular-shaped tent. And all you can do is, is lie flat in it. And so if you spend about three or four months lying flat in a little triangular-shaped tent, you begin to lose a lot of the zing of camping. You know, Abercrombie and Fitch uh, just uh, doesn't make it. Now, one of the things that you have to do at, at, in this type of camping, you've got to dig a little trench all around your tent, and the trench is supposed to drain off the water. You got it? Now, part of uh, that is the water that, uh, that is drainable. All the rest of it is soaked into your clothing. It's soaked into your blankets. It's soaked into your, your soul, and you lay there at night, and uh, you can hear, you can just hear the rain dripping down. I don't know. It always seems to rain on bivouac. You hear the rain coming down. You can hear you can hear the water seeping in under the bottom of the shelter half. And once in a while, you'll hear some guy with an oh, inchoate cry, you know, just an inchoate cry of rage. You'd hear it once in a while down in the, the maybe four or five tenths removed in the blackness. Somebody, get up! You jump, and and he jumps out of the tent. You just get stir crazy. That's exactly what happens. You literally get stir crazy. I I, I remember one guy. One night, after about three months in the field, in uh, alternate rain, snow, heat, all various types of things that happen to you, one guy just 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 went out of his bird. Uh, he flipped. Yeah, have you ever seen a guy flip? You know what he did? He did something that all of us secretly always wanted to do. He stood up in his pup tent, just stood bolt upright. Well, look, t you know, the tent's only about two and a half or three feet high. <laughs> well, he stood up. And, and, of course, the tent all popped and all the, all the uh, tent pegs popped up out of him. He said, I had enough of this damn thing. And he ran down the company street, trailing his, his tent behind him and all the ropes and stuff like that. And, of course, here laying in the open was his shelter half partner. See, two guys occupy each one of these tents. And this guy's laying there with the rain coming down on his face. And his buddy jumped up and ran down the company street and disappeared into the weeds. Well, it happened about 4 o'clock in the morning, and, and uh, everybody just laid there for a couple of seconds. They didn't know what happened, you know. And, and all of a sudden, somebody started to break out the flashlights and stuff, and they could just see this big hole in the ground where these guy, this guy jumped up, a few tent pegs laying there. And here was this guy laying in the, in, the, in, the, <laughs> in, the, in the flashlight beams. His buddy was laying there, and he was not yet awake. He was just laying What's the matter? And then the rain is coming down. He figured at long last that it had happened. Whatever it is, it had happened, say, and he had this look of fantastic fear. And we didn't find this guy. He ran off in the weeds. 
Now, this was in the middle of the Ozark, where you can get lost awful quick. I'll tell you, next to the Everglades, I think you could get lost quicker in the Ozarks. This guy wandered around for about a week out in the weeds, trailing a shelter half. He wore a shelter half like a poncho or something. And they finally caught this guy, and they brought him back to the camp. And, I, I, you know, <laughs> he sat in the back of a truck with a shelter half. And they were taking him into town. They, actually, what they were going to do, they were going to send him off to another camp, see, where eventually he would get what was euphemistically called a Section 8. Now, a Section 8 means a Section 8. That, uh, ask your nearest ex-GI what a Section 8 is, he'll tell you. And he sat in the back of the truck laughing at us. I remember he's, he's laughing at us, and, and uh, everybody felt, uh, you know, not, well, there were two schools of thought. One, one group felt sorry for him, and the other group uh, kept figuring out why in the hell they didn't do it. Because he's going, see, he's going. He's in this, he's in this warm truck, and they're taking him away. And we just lay there, and the rain coming down. Well, I, you can you can see the scene. See, we had a, a field kitchen, and uh, here's what the field. Uh, well, for those of you who don't know what a field kitchen is, it's a it's a lot of it's a like a lean to actually, and it has these uh, ovens that they have to bury in the ground, and uh, and on top of that they have these GI cans. Uh, with hot water cooking in them all the time. You're supposed to clean out your mess kits and stuff with the hot water. Yeah, you dip them in the hot water. First you dip them in the, in the lukewarm, soapy water, and you slosh it around in there. Then you dip them around in the rinse water, which is supposed to be boiling hot. And that's supposed to take all the soap off, the, off your mess kit. Well, about three times out of ten, it didn't. And then what would hit the company is a thing called the GIs. Now, if you think X-Lax is effective, all i got to say is you ought to try GI soap. Uh, it's a, it causes a lot of excitement. Uh, <laughs> we don't go into that here. After all, it's Thanksgiving. But uh, nevertheless, about a week before Thanksgiving, and here we are, we're deep in the heart of the Ozarks, and, uh, and uh, we've been out there now for about seven, eight months, and the rain is coming down steadily, and... And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, boredom is, is hanging so heavily on your hands that you could actually take pieces of it, knead it in your hands. Yeah, have you ever felt a piece of boredom? Well, it's kind of soft. It's like silly putty. And uh, you could just take it in your hands. You know, you can make snowballs out of it and throw it back and forth, you know. And uh, the, the biggest thing every day was mail call. That was the number one thing out there in bivouac. This, this, uh, this troop uh, carrier would come ro- roaring up the path and the guy would holler, mail, mail, call. And uh, he'd jump out in the back, and he's got all the mail. And he'd start handing out mail. And, of course, there would be a brief flurry of excitement. And then uh, there'd be a couple of moans. And guys would, uh, yeah, go running off into the weeds. The, uh, we had our daily quota of Dear John letters. Now, what is it, a Dear John letter? Well, it's a, it's a long-distance airmail letter, which is given the, some guy in your company to mitten. I mean, the real fast mitten. And what is it, the mitten? Well, it's Dear John. Every letter starts out very formal like that. Dear Fred, I have been thinking many things over. Well, you shouldn't read any more. (laughs) Or, Dear Fred, do you remember Howard, who you once met the time you picked me up at the office? Don't read any further. Just take that letter, friend, Well, some guys didn't. uh, Some guys even went further than tearing them up. They did other things with them letters. That's right. That's very handy in that case. If uh, that is, if it's the right kind of stationery. However, uh, the dear John letter, that oh, the dear John letter. uh, There's hardly a man alive today who hasn't gotten one form or another of the dear John. Now, the point that he did not know at the time was that was probably the best thing that ever happened to him. But at the time, it's very difficult to know. You know, it's like. uh, uh, that reminds me, you know, the place you work at, you generally think is the worst place in the face of the Western world. You know, it is only later when you get a job at another place that you realize, <laughs> that reminds me, this is W.O.R. New York. Hit the button, will you please? We're in the fourth grade from PS41, and we want to see the Red Baron of Lufthansa German Airlines. Is he real? Of course he's real. Only today the Red Baron is inspecting the Lufthansa kitchens in New York. In first class, the Red Baron has a menu just like you get in a fancy restaurant. And you can pick whatever you wish from the menu. I know. I have flown with the Red Baron. My father says Lufthansa is a German airline. 
And the red baron is on every plane to make sure everything goes just right. Not really. On every Lufthansa flight, there are nice stewardesses to serve you your food and drinks and help you to be comfortable. And also, we have man stewards, too. They all can tell you places to see and things to do when you get to Germany. After all, nobody would know Germany better than us. That's why so many people fly to Germany on Lufthansa. Because the Red Baron tells them to. No, because they like Lufthansa. I ought to know. Oh, you're Mrs. Red Baron? Uh, why don't you just say we're good friends? Hey, old buddy boy, does the uh, beautiful, uh, exciting thought of uh, driving on snow-covered Jersey roads give you the pip? <laughs> Well, you don't have to. Your local General Tire headquarters has the answer. They're standing there stalwart and solid. They'd like to put a pair of General's famous winter cleat snow tires on your car, get rid of those baldies, and uh, this time you'll actually get out of those drifts instead of spending the month of December up to your hubcaps yelling and screaming. So uh, remember the promise. You go in snow or General pays the toll. Now, if you're in the beautiful Perth Amboy area... See Carl Villani at General Tire Service, 91 New Brunswick Avenue in Hope Lawn. Now we're going to lay down a real goodie here for you. Yes, sir. For those of you who know about the House of Chan, it's kind of silly for me to tell you about it, but the House of Chan at 7th Avenue and 52nd Street has been here longer than New York. I mean, it's an official Chinese restaurant. It's not one of these little cockamamie Chinese. This is a real Chinese restaurant. And by the way, they have a fantastic cocktail hour from 4.30, well, it's actually two hours, 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. That's the Chinese hour, you see. It's much longer than ours. The House of Chen has a new cocktail bar, which serves free hot Chinese hors d'oeuvres, pronounced in the Chinese, or su mi, or su mai, depending on whether you're from the south side or not. This is uh, the House of Chen, fantastic Chinese food, seven days a week, 7th Avenue and 52nd Street. Hiya, kong sai! Hey, you know, it finally happened. I was in a place here a couple of days ago in Nashville. You know, I remember, uh, oh, it was 1962, 1962. I was playing in a nightclub down in the village. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a place called uh, Number One Sheridan. Number One Sheridan Square, down in the village. And just about this time of the year, as a matter of fact. And one of the things that I did that night, uh, when I was playing a whole, it was a, a three-week engagement down there. One of the things that I did in my bit was to do a folk singer of the future. Yeah, I said, you know, there's going to be folk singers of the future. I says, let's face it all. What, what is a folk song? A folk song is generally a functional song that comes out of the people. You know, it sings about their hopes and their fears, right? <laughs> well, you know, that's what a folk song usually is. And it comes out of the people. And a folk song generally is not really recognized at the time when it is a folk song by the intellectuals of the day. It's a fact. You know, some guy sitting on a back porch plunking his banjo, singing about my mama's got the big blues. Well, you know, they, the intellectuals of the day don't dig it. It's the intellectuals that come later to dig that, right? And he's sitting there on the back porch, you know, chewing his tobacco. He says, Mama's got the blues. Yeah, Mama's got the big blues. Mama's got the blues today. And why is he singing that? Well, he's bugging her. See, she's in the kitchen now, and she keeps saying, Will you shut up? It's none of your business how I feel. And he goes, Mama's got the blues today. Yeah, Mama's got them big old blues. I done spent my pay down at Charlie's place, and Mama's got the blues today. And he's, he's singing a folk, you know, functional folk song, right? Well, my bit was about a folk singer of the future. And I, I, in fact, even recorded this. I have it on tape someplace. And the idea was that I came out with a guitar. I can play about five chords on the guitar. And I came, and that's about, well, that's about the extent of the average folk singer's repertoire on the guitar anyway. See, so I came out and I strummed the G minor chord. And the lights went down. You know how they always present a folk singer. See, and I looked very heroic. And I had this shirt ripped open at the collar. And I looked out at the audience and I said, Folks, I'm here tonight to sing some folk songs of the past. Some wonderful songs that meant so much to them people of the past and gone days. Back in the mid-20th century, for example, over 100 years ago, people sang songs like this. And they were songs of the people. I'd like to sing one of you. One of them for you right now, folks. And I go plung on the guitar. 
And I start out plung. Oh, Chiquita Banana is the banana for you. Chiquita Banana is the banana for you. Keep them Chiquita Bananas in the refrigerator. Chiquita Banana is the one for you. I said, back in those days, they had a fruit called a banana. For those of you who don't know what these things are about, it was a fruit that came from the tropical countries, and many people would eat bananas back in those days, over 150 years ago, when they actually ate food. And uh, back in those early days before civilization. And uh, this song is one of the great songs of that period. Here's another one that may some of you... Uh, uh, possibly may have in your, in your collection. Plung, I'd hit another G minor chord. Plung, and I'd sing, Pepsi-Cola hits the spot. Pepsi-Cola hits the spot. To well, full ounces for a nickel too. Pepsi-Cola is the drink for you. Now, folks, for those of you who don't know what Pepsi-Cola is, it was a drink of them very early days back in the 20th century. Well, now, you laugh, all right? You're sitting in there laughing because we all know about Pepsi-Cola, right? And we all know about Chiquita Banana. And I did this in 1962. Well, what do you think? What do you think happened to me the other night? All right, I'll tell you. I walk into. Uh, see, you know, it really scares you. I'm beginning to believe I'm clairvoyant or something because the other night I walk into this bar in Nashville, Tennessee, and I sit down. I said, the guy comes over. He says, "What do you have?" I'm I'm talking Nashville. He said, "What do you have?" I said, "Well, make it Jack Daniels." He said, Bourbon, you want the green or the black label? And I said, you got both here? He said, you're in Tennessee. I said, well, make it green label. He said, how do you take it? I said, well, I think I'll have it on the rocks. A little twist of lemon. It's the only way to drink it, son. He walks away to get it. Well, all of a sudden, the lights go on, and on, on the stage comes this folk singer. You know, we're down in Nashville. You know, to, Well, it's not really a folk. It's C&W singer, see? And the, and the lights get purple, and this guy steps out there, and he's got this 10-gallon hat. He says, I'd like to sing some folk songs of our time. I'd like to sing a song that all you know. Yeah. He says, I'd like to sing a song that all you know. He said, and here it comes at you. Chrysler Plymouth coming through. And I thought to myself, my God almighty, it's come to pass. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, you, you get a little scared when you... Would you predict things? But I'm I'm going to tell you this right now, that the that the commercial has become the folk song of our time. It's the only song most people know. And by the way, speaking of commercials, hey, uh, friend, I hate to bring bad news. You know, I so often do this. Does a thought of driving on snow covered roads in the Bronx give you the chills? It certainly does, Lindsay. I would uh, suggest that you uh, get ready this year early by picking up a set of uh, General's famous winter cleat snow tires. They're beautiful. I mean, they'll even take you through the Bronx in the middle of the snow. In fact, uh, General says says this, you go in snow or big General pays the toll. So, uh, you know, that's more than Lindsay did for you. In Oakhurst, Dick Flanagan at Flanagan Tire and Automotive Center, 1639, Route 35. That's the Dick Flanagan. You asked for him. Well, uh, you're going to be delighted to hear that the Mike Douglas show is in Miami. <laughs> With Jackie Gleason as co-host, don't miss the comedy and the nostalgia tomorrow at 4.30 on Channel 2 New York. Mike Douglas. Friends, uh, we have another spot. Hit the button there, please, if you will. And now, the continuing adventures of Shoe Town's own Super Shoe. We return to the exciting case of the gang that stole Santa. Gosh, Super Shoe, we've flown everywhere looking for Santa Claus. Italy, France, South America. We've hardly had time to look for the first quality, famous name, great value shoes for the entire family for Lionel's Shoe Town stores. Gee, Super Shoe, I hope Lionel won't be angry. Santa Claus missing, and only Shoe Town Super Shoe can find him while he's circling the globe looking for famous brand shoes to sell at incredibly low Shoe Town prices. Uh, let's see, uh, men, uh, men, hey, men, men, Super Shoe wants you to make Shoe Town your headquarters for shoe shopping and saving, and you know how Super Shoe is. You get smart, he's level hit you in the face with one of the big fat clod hoppers. So this week, he's offering you an exceptional buy on great looking winter footwear. First quality boots done in dark brown suede with thick pile lining for warmth and rough textured soles for traction when you really got to get out of the neighborhood fast. They're valued to 15 bucks, but Shoe Town's got them for only eight eighty-eight. So you better hurry to Shoe Town. This sale ends Saturday. Saturday, Shoe Town. Well, here's our little Gramercy Park message of tonight. Let's see what they say. Gramercy Park, close of 64 West 23rd Street in New York, says, and we quote, Mr. 
Just because you're a big size guy doesn't mean you can't save money on your clothes. Gramercy Park doesn't care if you're big and tall, short and fat, or somewhere in between. What's a couple of inches or a couple of yards of cloth, more or less? If you've been paying more because hard to fit guys always seem to pay more, here's what to do. Go up to the third floor of the factory building at 64 West 23rd Street. Go through the big iron gate and take a look at their suits around there. They're famous. That's Gramercy Park Clothes. They're open on Saturday to 6. They're open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Sunday even. Gramercy Park Clothes, 64 West 23rd Street. Third floor, 64 West 23rd Street. Third floor, bum ba dum bum Well, here's another one of your favorite little goodies here. I'm sure that you're all waiting out there. You can start your tape recorders if you want to save this as a uh, souvenir of this age. <laughs> the times rugged that we're passing through. Uh, it's a general tire spot. And if you're uh, contemplating uh, not only your navel, but you're contemplating the idea of getting a set of, uh, of uh, snow tires this year, well, you do it the general way because they have their great uh, slogan, you go in snow or general pays the toe. And their tires are called winter cleat tires. And they're four rib snow tires and they work, which is not something that every snow tire can say really get you out of the snow. Now, let's see. You can see Bob McCormick at State Line Tire, 80 Westport Avenue in Norwalk. Now, no, I'm not going to do the Christmas fun. It's Thanksgiving. We'll let the Christmas fun go for Christmas. You know, oh, oh yeah, I was going to tell you that story. I, I, I kind of hate to think about it. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a bad... Uh, in a way, it was a kind of a great afternoon. Uh, if uh, You know, some things only become good in retrospect. A lot of things. Uh, many things, when you're living through them, are really, you know, what a drag, man. But uh, about ten days before Thanksgiving, uh, our sergeant, Sergeant Kowalski, and his name really was Kowalski, Sergeant Kowalski, this little short guy, he looked like a fire plug with feet, you know. He always wore sunglasses, no matter what. There's a certain kind of guy that wears sunglasses all the time. These green Air Corps types. And he wore these sunglasses when it was raining, when it was snowing at night, all the time. And he had these pressed fatigues. Boy, he was sharp all the time. And one afternoon, in the middle of a, of a, of a soft, drifting, icy, rotten, stinking rain, I was standing around in my raincoat trying to look like I was busy. The one thing you learn when you're in the Army is always keep looking like you got something to do. This is a very invaluable rule you learn. Because the minute you stand there and your jaw slacks open, some guy, some guy with two stripes usually, is going to see and say, Hey, you over there, come on, what are you doing? Come on over here. Come on over you, you and that other guy over there. Hey, you over there. You know, the guy that's trying to run away from behind the trucks into the weeds. Hey, come here. All right, you guys. I got a detail for you two. Oh, man. After that, you know, you don't start, you don't fake. You're working. And that's the one thing you try to avoid all the time. So uh, I'm, I'm standing there trying to look busy, and it ain't easy trying to look busy, you know, just sort of making movement all the time, like carrying stuff, moving around. The rain is coming down. The whistle starts to blow. Well, that means assemble. So everybody comes running over into the mud and stands there with the rain drifting down. And directly behind us was the field kitchen. And you can smell it. Uh, the field kitchen is, uh, you know, that's got these, these coke fires burning away and you could smell it there was a kind of a drifting smoky smell all the time and also the smell of vaguely how can i say it vaguely fermenting dishwater is what always hangs around the smell of a field kitchen and and uh, we're, we're standing in the rain there kowalski's walking back and forth with his clipboard and he's got the the you know he's always got a big important announcer all right you guys eddie's all right his just Orders just come down from Army Headquarters that as of uh, the day before Thanksgiving, we have been given the we've been given the orders that we can allow one third of the men on this particular command can have a five day pass for Thanksgiving. Now we don't want any question of favoritism to arise. What a joke! We don't want any question of favoritism to arise. We're going to do this fair and square. The exec and the CEO are going to draw names out of a hat in the orderly tent. And in just two hours, the names will be posted on the bulletin board 
as to those guys who can get passes one day before Thanksgiving. You are not allowed to travel any further than 800 miles from this command. And if all you, any of you guys live further than 800 miles and you want to make a pass, forget it. You're not going to get a pass. It's going to be a restricted 800-mile pass. However, it will all be done by drawing straws, drawing names out of a hat. Any questions? No questions. We shifted around in the mud and waited. Well, I don't know whether any of you know that feeling of waiting for two hours to find out whether you're going to be sprung or not. It just goes by like molasses flowing down an iceberg. And that ain't fast. Well, we're sitting around. I'm sitting squatting in my tent with Goldberg. Amir Goldberg is sitting there. He was my tent mate all the time. So Goldberg is sitting there. We had been just given tent mates by the, simply by numbers. And I'm sitting there with Goldberg. And Goldberg always smoked a pipe. Now, he, I, I don't know what kind of tobacco it was that Goldberg smoked, but it, it produced a curious purple smoke. And it was very thick. <laughs> it, would, it would hang in the top of the tent. And every time you would raise your head above six inches off of your, off your bedroll, your head would be in this thick purple fog. It was something like uh, six nights in a Turkish bordello or something. Yeah, that, that kind of very perfumey type tobacco. So we're both sitting in this, in this tent, very nervous. And, and Goldberg is puffing away on his pipe. And he had this big calabash. And we're both sitting in there and made this purple haze, saying nothing. The rain is drifting down, and finally Goldberg says, he said, no, we're not going to get it. Just not. I never want nothing in my life. I said, will you shut up, Goldberg? Uh, one thing I've learned, Goldberg, ever since I was a kid, that if you talk about something, it ain't going to happen. Now shut up. Pretend like you don't want to pass. So that's ridiculous. Pretend like I don't want to pass. I got... I got mold growing between my toes from this rain and this mud. I gotta get out. I'm gonna go out of my mind. And he go. <gasps> he had this pipe, and it would make the sucking sound. <clears throat> Ever since that time, every time I hear a guy s- sucking on a pipe, and it makes that slurping sound, you know, like somebody working a plumber's helper. You know that sound? <clears throat> I always think of. I-, I can smell that dishwater, and I smell that purple smoke, and I get that itchy feeling. By the way, another thing about being on bivouac, you don't take a shower. Uh, sometimes you don't take a shower for weeks on end. And you start to itch all over. And your clothes, my fatigues would dry on me. And then they would get wet again. And they would dry on me. And you develop curious kinds of rashes and little pimples. And all, ooh, you know, all kinds of stuff. So we're both sitting. Yeah, I'm just telling you the truth of, the, of Army life. So we're sitting in the tent. Just waiting, and all around us, there are other guys sitting in tents. The next tent is Zinsmeister and Gasser. Edwards is down there. We're just waiting. You could smell that fermenting dishwater. Now, for at least four or five months, we've been on field rations. Now, field rations include such delicacies as powdered eggs, right? Powdered eggs. Now, what is a powdered egg like? Well, a powdered egg, have you ever tasted library paste? Well, a powdered egg is like warm, diluted paste with salt and pepper on it. It does not taste anything like an egg, at least the way they fixed them in my company. There's nothing like an egg. It's kind of a whitish, uh, kind of a strange gruel-like, and they would fry them. They, they would make them into, into what they call scrambled eggs. And every morning, we're getting this curious paste every morning for breakfast. You get that paste, and you'd also get this rubber toast, which they would make by putting a big rack over the top of the oven in the in the field kitchen. They did the best they could, you know, but it wasn't it wasn't what you wanted to have. And these guys ate it too, so nobody was getting, you know, it was just everybody had the same thing. And you'd get this scalding hot coffee every morning. And let me point out that up to the point that I got out on that field kitchen, I was strictly a milk type. I drank milk every day. I never drank coffee. And I didn't drink coffee for at least two weeks until I came into that field situation out on bivouac. And one night, after spending an all-night laying wire in the cold, at 4 o'clock in the morning, we got back into the field kitchen area, and we, we staggered up to the kitchen that we'd been out all night. I'll never forget this night. Uh, the, the, the cook 
he's got some stuff for us to eat. See, they made some cold bologna sandwiches, which is all they could make at night because we weren't supposed to start fires. And he had heated some water. And he says, you guys want, he says, which, which one of you guys want? And by the way, they were giving us powdered milk at this point, which they would mix with, mix with water. So he says, any of you guys want water? He says, you want any milk? So I got these sandwiches, you guys, so dig into the sandwiches. He's doing the best he can, for sure. Yeah, I always felt sorry for the cooks. They work night and day, so don't think I'm putting down cooks, man. Those guys really, really put out. So the guy's up there at 3 or 4 in the morning. He's giving us sandwiches, and he says, uh, he says, any guy, he says uh, just holler it out. You want milk? You want coffee? So we had two big 32-gallon j- cans. One's got powdered milk in it, which I was drinking up to that point. And the others got this scalding hot coffee. Something said to me, if I don't have this coffee, I'm going to die. Now, I didn't drink coffee. I didn't like coffee. But I needed something hot. I mean, really. And so he just takes this big ladle, and he just ladles in a great big ladle full of this scalding hot coffee into my canteen cup, you know, at the end of the handle. And I sat down next to a truck in the dark, and it was raining. And I got this hot coffee. And it was the first time in my life that I understood what coffee was about. I smelled it, and it was fantastic. It just smelled like, well, it's like the smell that must come out of heaven on a Sunday morning. I just smelled that coffee. And it was scalding hot, and I had this big bologna sandwich in my other hand that was ice cold because it was so cold there. And, and you know, a cold bologna sandwich on unbuttered bread is not the, the, you know, it's not the grooviest thing in the world. Well, I took a sip of that coffee. It was hot, scalding hot. But suddenly, music played in my soul. It came from way down deep in my gut someplace. Now, this coffee was black without sugar. And I just took a big sip of it, and my God Almighty, did that taste good. I took a bite of that of that salami, that big bologna sandwich, and I started to chew it, and then I took another big sip of that hot coffee. It was one of the best things I ever tasted in my life. After being out in that cold, laying that wire, well, I drank that whole canteen cup full of coffee, and I went back and I got another one. I figured, that must be a fluke. And I got another one, and that tasted even better. And ever since that time, you can't say anything bad about coffee around me. I'll tell you. Two nights later, and by the way, at this point, I am a non-drinking, non-coffee drinking, everything. I was as clean as the driven snow. Two nights later, I'm laying in the weeds. The rain is coming down. And I'm laying next to another guy, a guy named Dye, Edward L. Dye. PFC Edward L. Dye from Minneapolis, Pennsylvania, Minneapolis, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Dye is laying beside me, and we are attempting to lay a wire, a telephone wire, under cover of darkness. It ain't easy. And we've got this reel of wire between us. We're crawling forward, and all of a sudden, Dye says to me, Hey, Shep. I said, What do you want, Dye? He says, Hey, Shep. You want something out of my canteen? I said, what do you got? I had my canteen filled with lukewarm cocoa, which is made out of powder. He says, well, here, take a sip of this. And he hands me the canteen in the dark. I go, unbelievable. All of a sudden, it went right down to my feet. I could feel warm. I was warm all over. It was the first time I ever tasted bourbon. Where he got it, I don't know, and he wouldn't say. But he had a canteen full of bourbon. And I want to tell you this, it made laying that wire awful nice that night, and I had never even known what this stuff did. You know, I always thought it made you... It didn't do that. It just made me feel warm. Well, so you know the scene. Me and Goldberg are squatting in the tent there. We've been out on field now for four, five, six months. Seemed like a hundred years. Everything around it smelled of mold. That's another great thing. When you overcoat everything, your, your, your fatigues are moldy because of the rain and the wet. You're never dry. The whistle blew again. And, man, we fell out. We stood, we stood at attention as best we could in the mud. And Kowalski started to read the names of the guys that were leaving. 
and you could hear, you know, you could hear this little cheer. You'd hear a muffled cheer all around you, muffled cheers. He finished reading the list. One third of the guys were in seventh heaven. The other two thirds just wandered back and sat down in a tent. Guess who sat down at a tent together? Me and Goldberg. Well, Thanksgiving Day, which came on a cold, wet, drippy morning, they gave us the day off. We didn't have to do anything. We'd lay in our tents. At 8 o'clock in the morning, the cook goes from tent to tent. He says, hey, you guys, I got something for you. Come on down to the, come on down to the kitchen. And I wake up out of a half doze amid the rain. He says, bring your, bring your mess kit. And he goes from tent to tent. And guys started to get up. And we started to wander down through the rain, through this gloppy, wet, squishy little company street that we had made. And I could smell some. My God, I couldn't believe it. We all lined up. And he, someplace, had gotten four cases of fresh eggs. He got himself about 15 pounds of sliced smoked bacon. Where he got it, it was a surprise. We had had none of that. He got himself a couple of cases of, of milk with cream on it, on the top, real milk. And he got himself about 20 pounds of smoked, fresh, country sausages. You know those little short ones? And we lined up that morning... And we had eggs any way we wanted them. Fried. I had some fried. I came back for some scrambled. I came back later and I, I tried them all ways. You know, I said, because he said, any way you want them. I said, uh, how about uh, poached? He says, poached eggs coming up right now. He said, you wait over by the truck and I'll call them out when they're ready. And for two hours, we ate fresh eggs. It was Thanksgiving. We ate fried bacon smoked country fried bacon. We ate country fried smoked sausages. We had strawberry jam, fresh strawberry jam. We had toast, fresh toast. And by the way, I don't know where he got it. He had rye, he had white, he had whole wheat, he had any kind of toast you wanted. And for two and a half hours, we just scoffed it down. Kowalski walked back. He didn't go on past either, see? That made it okay. Kowalski walked back and forth up there. He says, you guys eat up, man. He says, you eat up all you want. He says, and after you're through, you go back and you can sleep all you want today. Nobody ain't going to bother you. And I remember crawling back in my tent, see? And I brought back a couple of hard-boiled eggs. Make sure I had a couple there in case I woke up hungry. Goldberg is laying there next to me, wrapped up in his blanket... He's got himself an omelet between two slices of bread, thickly spread with strawberry jam and liberally laved over with maybe 15, 20 pounds of smoked country sausage. He's laying back there. I said, you know, Goldberg? He says, what? So I'm kind of glad I didn't get a pass. He says, so am I. I said, just think all that trouble riding that bus. I mean, listen to all that flapping of MMPs, showing all them passes. He says, yep. Rip. I said, that sounded good, Goldberg. I think I'm going to go back and get myself some more eggs. We just kind of rested all afternoon in the rain. It was a groovy Thanksgiving. This is WOR New York. Stay tuned for Big Lester Smith and the News. News and detail on the hour from the WOR Newsroom. The best holiday dinner may come tomorrow. For patrons of strike-bound restaurants in New York City, tonight the president of striking Local 89 Hotel and Restaurant Employees Union said that cooks and other kitchen help will return to work tomorrow. Emil Bonatti said the return to work decision was based on his locals getting a satisfactory settlement with the restaurant league. Another factor, Local One dining room employees had earlier announced that it will put a possible contract settlement 
before that union's membership at a meeting tomorrow morning. Both the local and the league representatives have recommended that the pact be approved. Bonatti's local had gone on strike last Saturday. For some two weeks now, the various restaurants have been forced to close when local ones' waiters, busboys, bartenders, and other workers went on strike, and then the kitchen workers followed. Negotiations are scheduled for tomorrow in the Teamster strike against some metropolitan area bakeries. Working conditions and a wage and benefit increase are to be discussed. Newark, New Jersey's Mayor Kenneth Gibson announced today that he has accepted the resignation of the head of a federally funded anti-crime program rather than allow Washington to cut off the program's $20 million for the city. Earl Phillips is out because he said he was given an ultimatum by the Federal Law Enforcement Assistance Administration and the State Law Enforcement Planning Agency. According to Phillips, both agencies did not want his five-year crime-reducing plan to turn into a preventive and social program. Instead, they wanted what Phillips called a police-type plan. A Unitarian minister has been charged with embezzling $112,000 from the Family Council Service of Middlesex County, New Jersey. Now the problem is to apprehend 35-year-old Reverend William Rogers Fortner of Somerset. Middlesex County Prosecutor John Kothau said that the minister had purchased a one-way ticket to Portugal and left the United States on Tuesday. Extradition proceedings are underway. A county grand jury indictment says that the Reverend Mr. Fortner misapplied and misused the counseling service funds between December 1971...